Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Vanessa, Young, Mimi, and Hormuz. Uh, I'm happy that uh, this panel came together, uh, and uh, I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say about uh, developing gallery structures. So we were asked to do this talk, this panel, not because um, we, not well, the, the reason is we come from different places and we have different um, uh, gallery systems where we come from, and we sort of do all different things. So I wanted to hand the mic to each of these um, panelists and um, just to introduce yourselves and talk about uh, why you're here. Okay. Vanessa? Um, yeah, so my gallery, Carlos Ishikawa, it's uh, started in late 2011. Um, I'm originally from Brazil, but the gallery is based in London, uh, and we represent a sort of wide range of international artists. But I suppose probably the main reason I'm here is because um, I started a project called Condo, which is a large-scale uh, collaborative exhibition that happens in London, New York, uh, Mexico City, and Shanghai, and then in occasional other cities. This year, that city will be Sao Paulo. Hi, I'm Young. Um, I'm here because the artist that we're showing planted a seed about Asia. So then we applied for the fair and got in. Oh. You know, all, you know, like we do what the artists are like suggesting, or like so we're planting seeds everywhere. And then I think in a conversation, Gala said, "Let's do Asia." So we applied and we're here. So it's very, so we don't usually do art fairs, you know, like we, we do have a business license, but then we program like a nonprofit. Um, I think like I came out as an artist, I'm back in the closet as an artist, but I bring, now bring artists together. And it's usually, um, I guess like what the artists want. Okay. I suppose I'm here because when we first started, uh, we had a primary focus on con contemporary photography, which was, maybe still is, uh, a very, very underrepresented art medium in the Hong Kong art scene and art market. Uh, hi. <clears throat> is this working? Yes. Okay. So I am Hormoz and Mation. Um and um, I started Daston's Basement about in 2012. Um, it was actually an extension of my engineering practice. Um, I had an office that was a little bit big for me, so I thought uh, we turned it into a space that we can show experimental projects and um, documentary viewings, um, uh, different projects. Um, and they, they told me you need a permit for that, and the permit has to be a gallery permit. So we got that and started working. About six months later, uh, we closed, uh, you know, just it, nothing else mattered. So other jobs were quit and uh, gallery became a gallery. And now we're exhibiting in um, two permanent spaces in Tehran and two semi-permanent ones uh, around the city. And we're spreading to other cities in Iran. Uh, very happy to be here. OK. Thank you, everyone. So I just wanted to get the ball rolling um, with the question. Uh, you talked about Kondo. You talked about this sort of artist-initiated practice. Um, when the, he sent us an email, and it's it's pretty much it's like a no plan plan, you know, which works um, very underground, very organic. And then you have Mimi, who does uh, photography, but also has moved into sort of the contemporary art umbrella. And then you have um, Hormos, an, uh, who has Dastan's basement. And I, I wanted to start off with, um, who is Dastan? <laughs> Actually, um, interesting. Um, it doesn't have an interesting story. It's just that the day um, I was uh, reading a lot about Iranian mythology at the time, and then they said uh, on the permit, I thought, like, you know, choosing a name for your gallery is going to be a very important uh, thing. And I, I just didn't know. Like, on the permit, it said, when I signed everything, they said, what is the name of the gallery? And uh, I just didn't know what to say. I, I thought about, like, you know, which was the you know, I chose one of the characters that I was reading about, 
in uh, the Persian Book of Kings, and I put it as that at that name. They said, so it's going to be Daston Gallery. I said, no, 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 no gallery. Just say Daston's basement, because it's a basement, so that uh, it didn't know it's going to be, like, we didn't know what. Uh, and who is Daston? Like the actual character? Yeah. Uh, he's a. Uh, I guess um, he's father to the most important character in the in the Book of Kings. Um, he's uh, this young. Um, he was born um, in the legend with white hair, so albino, and uh, so they abandoned him uh, in the mountain. And he was uh, raised by, um, you know, a, again mythological character called Seymour, uh, which is what they talk about in the Conference of Birds, and later returned to become, you know, um, an important figure. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Vanessa, uh, could you talk to us about these ideas of um, Kondo, and Kondo, vertical collaboration, artist contracts, interdependency. Take your pick. <laughs> Um, so Kondo, to, to explain the project a little bit more, it, the first time it happened in London was in 2016. And what I did was I approached um, galleries in London to act as host to international galleries. So they could either uh, curate a show together or they could assign a part of their space to this other gallery. And the um, initiative was very much thinking about, uh, or, or coming from this point of frustration with, the way that the art world um, seemed to be reflecting the world at large in that it's like a very sort of neoliberal pyramid that seems to point towards corporations. And I found it um, in, in many instances quite a suffocating environment because it means that um, there are some amazing art fairs that are really important for the ecosystem of the art world, but there's also a complete over-proliferation um, of art fairs that don't deliver as much and uh, the costs involved in that and the culture that it breeds of like not going to galleries to see shows anymore and the culture that it breeds in terms of like how a gallery might approach their artists to make an artwork for a fair and the considerations that would be um, much less experimental because of the costs involved. So Kondo was trying to address a different way of exhibiting your artists abroad. Um, in a way that would encourage all of those things, like a slower way of looking, more experimental projects, and so on. And I was also thinking about this idea of, you know, if we don't want to talk about communal or collaborative um, activities, then we should at least talk about interdependency. And I was really interested in, like, you know, when Tim Schneider um, wrote an article summarizing, like, the Talking Galleries Conference, and he said that, you know, what we all need to realize when we talk about the sort of mid size or younger gallery uh, squeeze is that it's kind of the same as like, you know, in an ecosystem, if all the bees die out, then it, it, the lions might think it doesn't matter, but like they'll be dead too. So um, I was thinking of interdependency in, in that kind of sense, something we need to recognize. And therefore, I'm interested in vertical collaboration, meaning that a lot of the galleries that take part in condo, although it's like mainly directed at younger galleries, because we are the ones who sort of perhaps uh, need that more. Um, I'm really excited by the much more established, even blue chip in some cases, galleries that participate in Kondo, um, who, who sort of encourage this very generous exchange by hosting younger galleries um, and vice versa. So galleries like Sadie Coles or Gavin Brown, um, Petzl this year, and, and many others have a Shang Art, um, have taken part in Kondo also. And I think that that's, uh, yeah, very essential. Um, how do you, how does Kondo perpetuate itself like you were, we were talking about how how does a gallery participate in condo so um it's the idea of labor is also um, seen through in the way that condos organize. So, for example, I'm the organizer in London, so I pick the London hosts, and then the visitors are a conversation between me and the host. So, some will be very specific and say, like, I want to invite my friend from Berlin, whatever. Others say to me, surprise me, like, suggest someone. Um, so, I do that, and then each other city, like Mexico City, has Ana Castello from um, Jose Garcia as the organizer. New York has Simone Sabal and Nicole Russo and um, Shanghai has Lorraine Maling from Edward Maling Gallery. Uh, so the process is the same. They kind of keep in touch with me so that we make sure that the parameters of the project are the ones that I intended. Um, but I try to give, you know, I don't pretend to know the art scenes in those cities. Uh, so the process is almost like a self-selecting one. 
Okay. So the website is condo? It's condocomplex.org. Condocomplex.org. Okay. And um, Young, um, your, your, your program feels like um, it's very free-flowing. And it's like uh, whatever, wherever the energy goes, that's where, you know. Could you tell us about that? And, and I guess from an organizational point of view, how does that work? Um, you know, like I try to like multiply myself. I mean, you know, um, I try to say we all the time so that it's like less lonely to do this. You know, like, because like sometimes I feel like um, like I'm running an orphanage or a community center. How many artists do you have? Um, right now we have 14, but that could easily be 28. You know, you can multiply for for all the artists who commit to this. Um, but I think from the beginning, like, I didn't go to school for business or anything like that. So, like, um, it was very much based on, um, like, trust and faith uh, with the artists. So, going back to what we were talking about in there, like, we don't sign contracts. And How many of you have contracts with your artists? Verbal contracts. Okay. Semi contracts. Okay. I mean, like, so, like, I didn't, I never approached, like, an artist saying, if you work with us, like, these are the things that I could guarantee you. Because, like, that's always setting up room for, like, disappointment, you know? So I, I've never wanted to, like, predetermine what we could be. So if all the artists left, Maybe we'll become a nonprofit. So, like, we operated for like four or five years without a business license, you know. I mean, then we had to get one because, like, like a like a private collector purchased an artwork for a museum, and then she added sales tax. So I had to run around all day and get one. But nothing really changed. I don't think people come to us thinking like, you know, it's like a shop. Um, but I think because the artists that we work with are so respected in their communities. Um, so with that comes, so like the space is supported by other artists and with that, uh, curators. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, like a lot of curators are yeah. now like kind of fostering relationships right. yeah. with collectors. It's, like part of, it's part of the system that yeah. sort of. So through them we get like few collectors here and there. But, Okay. Uh, Mimi, Hong Kong. What, what, I mean, y you've, you've sort of, um, in your write-up, you said that being a gallerist is a holistic experience. And uh, there are many, many things that um, you, you have to do in order to keep adapting. Actually, after reading what all of you said, I, I almost feel like gallerists, or at least gallerists um, of, of, of our generation, we're masochists. You know, we, we, we do this to ourselves. Um, and, but there's something, there's something that, that keeps us doing it, either a need or a passion, or we just don't know how to do anything else. So I just wanted to ask you, I mean, we're, we're all here in Hong Kong. Um, we come in for this this illusion called this wonderful, you know, this illusion of of, of, art, of art, which doesn't really exist in Hong Kong, you know. So, um, in your real life in Hong Kong, what is missing? Many, a th uh, few things are missing. Well, but uh, let me start with when I opened the gallery. I didn't set out to be part of the art market. When I opened the gallery, a bit like Young, uh, I always say I opened the gallery out of naivety. Um, when I first started the gallery, I wasn't sure what a commercial gallery, what a commercial gallery means. I was very ideological. I studied film and TV and I aspired to become an artist in that field. Um, and during that time, I'm not even talking about that long ago, Blinds, what was founded in 2010, nearly eight years ago. Um, no one was showing photography. It was before Gagosian and White Cube opened in Hong Kong. Uh, and no one was showing uh, young Hong Kong artists. So uh, 
out of naivety and uh, lots of frustration, I set up Blind Spot Gallery. Uh, we first, when we first started, we operated at two spaces, one small space around 700 square feet in Soho, Hong Kong, as a primary exhibition space, and then an annex, sort of an outpost, in an industrial building in the factory area in the south side of Hong Kong called Wang Chokang. We were the first gallery to open there, so we got no traffic. Um, but um, in 2014, I think the scene was starting to develop, and uh, um, well, we used to show at um, Art HK, that was a uh, former life of Art Basel Hong Kong, and people would walk in our booth and ask us, we're showing black and white photography, people would think those are posters, and they would ask whether these posters are for sale. Um, but the market has developed a lot in the recent years, um, and yeah, I forgot what the question is. The question is, what's missing in Hong Kong? What's missing in Hong Kong is uh, art criticism, as we discussed, Isa, previously. Um, I think Hong Kong, the local art scene and art market is still uh, largely driven by commercial activities. So art fairs, art auction, auction houses have been quite established for many years. Um, but there isn't been enough presence of institutions and museums and independent art spaces to you know, promote or provoke debate on art itself. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what's missing. But um, the Amplis is information, and it's going to open next year. And we have you know, sort of middle-sized, Kunsthalle size of art institutions, such as Tycoon, opening this year. Um, so hopefully the scene is, will be changing uh, in the near future. Just, just wondering, this do I, any of you pay attention to art critics? Is art criticism relevant in what you guys are doing? I think I think it's important because uh, uh, honestly, like uh, you know, I, we operate in Iran. Um, one of the main things that is missing over there is uh, basically uh, infrastructure, uh, room for discourse. So um, actually the reason that we do a lot of the things that we do is precisely this. Um, we are like, just to talk about, um, maybe I should take a few steps back. So basically uh, when I look at um, the gallery, we decided that the gallery is going to be more of a fluid concept um, as not dependent so much on space and rather uh, shifting the focus onto exhibition, right? So we wanted to do more and more exhibitions. And it's uh, like pop-ups? You wanted to do pop-ups? Exactly. We, we introduced something called Daston Outside, uh, which would do um, basically um, exhibitions anywhere. So it wasn't confined to the basement in many ways. And um, we thought, you know, we should do everything by exhibition. So it was going to be education by exhibition. It was going to be uh, marketing and advertisement by exhibition, and uh, even sales by exhibition. Um, to create a lot of the infrastructure in that way. Like, for example, the Sun Outside started um, um, going to places where it would fit uh, the artwork best, so that we would provide the better environment for the artwork to be displayed. But at the same time, we were going to audience uh, around the city where needed. Um, it, it allowed for a larger number. For example, last year we did 64 exhibitions. Uh, That's a lot. <laughs> yes, um, but um, it, it wants to create sort of that discourse. Because, uh, like for example, V Gallery, one of them that we do larger scale exhibitions, it allows for curated shows uh, where we use uh, the emerging, uh, like where we use, uh, where we use a curation, we use the curation to connect, um, you know, the older uh, generation to the younger, uh, so that we bridge that gap. It acts in a way. I I don't want to take. Uh, say something that I would regret, but uh, it tries to do what a museum has to do now in order to create that that conversation so that when it, so that if people want to write about it they can and 
you go from curation to criticism to audience and try to uh, put the works in context. Uh, if, if there is no such thing, I feel that the public would have to be lost with the number of exhibitions that go on within, yeah. you know. But are there avenues? Are there? Do you have art critics in Iran? Oh yeah, we you do. do. We it's do. not enough, obviously. Yeah. But but yes, we do. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, energy. Okay, like we're we're all sort of in our forties. Are you in your forties? No. Am I the only one in my forties? <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, um, obviously, we all put a lot of time and energy and, and the years um, into what we do. And um, I wanted to get your take on what do you think, um, you know, we put in so much for our artists, for the program, for the cities we live, for the, the communities we we service, you know, either through, it, through showing art or educating or all that. Um, what is the ideal situation for you with regards to an artist relationship? So, well, f for me in particular, like um, when you're talking about how much we put in and so on, it's like uh, I had trained as an artist, so I recently realized that my whole thing with what the program does, it's like in a selfish way almost, I'm utilizing the artist to like explore the ideas that I'm interested in, which I no longer do through my own work. Um, but for that reason, in part for that reason, like my relationships with my artists are mostly very close. Um, some I consider them like family, but, um, and some I went to college with and I've known for, you know, 15 years. Okay, um, how, if, okay, let's say, just to add to that, uh, more than, let's say a professional relationship with the artists. Um, because in my gallery, uh, which is Silver Lens in Manila, when we started, we really started from nothing. I mean, I was also, I, I feel came. I like probably all did. No? Yeah, but the system, I mean, was very much, very unstructured. Um, you know, artists were showing in four or five galleries four or five times a year, the same thing. Um, and when we started working with them, we set uh, contracts in place. Um, and these were, it's like serial monogamy. You know, three year, two year contracts, which could be renewed, or they could opt out, or we could change it. And it took, it took us four years to convince the first artist to sign a contract. But once that artist signed, it sort of became a domino effect because people saw the advantage of having a gallery um, for having a, of having a gallery. So, and, and I realized that um, nobody else did it. Nobody, I mean, other countries and, and just feel like now that we're bigger, I mean, now that we're, I'm, we're 14 years into this, I feel like the contract, um, it, it sort of morphs into a marriage of sorts. So, I feel like any thoughts about that? I feel like people always use these like analogies like of romantic relationships between artists and galleries anyway. So everyone talks about their marriage and they're <laughs> flirting and did they sleep together yet? So um, I, I would say that the, the contract is like a formality mm -hmm. that I'm actually interested in thinking about. Um, but I think we would probably all describe our relationships with our artists as really close and like mm -hmm. weird marriages. Yeah. No? Well, they call me Mama Young. <laughs> oh, you know, I get uh, called Mama a lot as well. <laughs> Mama Young. I mean, I think it's if okay. If my interaction with an artist, with a given artist, uh, if that artist learns to like pour water or opt to, or be mindful of others, you know, um, like for example, like when I started the project on um, Commonwealth Avenue and Council Street, I emptied out my living room and my dining room, and I had an artist stay. Um, the second artist. Um, he was staying with me, and in the morning, he made a cup of tea for himself. The second day, I made a pot of tea for us. The third day, he made a pot to share. And I think that's something that you can never take away. And I think it's like amazing to see artists not be competitive with one another, but then look, actually look out and then um, help each other with grant application, like recommend one another. So there is 
like the sense of extend, you know, extended family. I mean, and I, I mean, I don't know what the formula is. You know, I don't know why it happens at Commonwealth and Council and not elsewhere. Or maybe there are different, um, different examples, right? But um, I mean, I think that's like the mythology of us in LA that when you walk in, like you get a glass of water, you know, and whether you ask for it or not. Okay. You know, so but, I never get anything done. But has yeah. has an artist ever left you? Uh, uh, um, not yet, because, uh, <laughs> because um, you know, like I never, you know, I maybe like I'm such a manipulator, you know, like passive aggressive. I don't know, mama, you know, like. I, maybe I guilt trip them. I don't know. Maybe they can like <laughs> abandon me. But you know, it wasn't. Um, you know, like maybe like, in the end, I really got what I wanted. You know, because I you know I hate doing one night stands with artists. You know, I want like a repeat sessions. You know, um, so it wasn't until January 2017 where the core group of six artists. Had a, you know gathered and had a meeting with me and said we support one another, uh, we support you and the space. Uh, what do you want? Do you want to grow with us? And that's that's how we started representing artists. I mean, we did we did help out with like cons you know loan forms and everything, but it was more so like I think it's like really empowering for the artists to feel like they're choosing to work with us rather than taking that power away, mm. you know? Okay, I think the system, I mean, that feels like a very, like an ideal system, or an artist-driven, yeah. I'm a romantic. Yeah, you are. But you gotta believe in Mama something. Young. I mean, I feel like I'm not trying to be like another gallery, right. you know, uh, that shows like, artists with talent and ingenuity and then only show like straight white men. You know, we are invested in women, queer, POC, and some allies. Right. That's why we're relevant mm -hmm. to the cultural landscape of LA. It reflects that. Yeah. Okay. Mimi? I'd, um, I find it very hard to not be personal in terms of building a relationship with artists because you you, you can only enter the world to, to a larger extent. To me, at least, I have to, they, they, beca they all become friends, we all become friends of each other in order for me to enter their world and to truly understand the art, to truly understand the person. Um, so when an artist dropped me for a bigger gallery to be one of the 60 gallery, uh, artists, I feel very hurt because I would try to tell them, you are one of my, 10 represented artists I would put in so much for you. Whereas if you switch the gallery, maybe you can increase your price by 20% instantly, but then you'll be one of the 60 artists. Um, so it, it's just very difficult for me. Uh, uh, uh. And I, I, in terms of contract, we talked about it briefly earlier. I'd, um, I want to, it, it helps protect the, 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 the galleries. And um, I, I believe more in the emotional contract. I mean, like, I have, you know, abandonment issues, too. You know, like, nobody wants to be dumped. Yeah. You know, like, nobody wants to be left alone. Yeah. You know, I'm always like, you know, I'm not a breeder. I'm not going to reproduce. You know, who's going to wipe my ass? You know, like, so, like, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, like, I'm fostering, I, I don't know, some kind of communal. No, I feel like I would say that most young galleries are, most young galleries are very idealistic. Most have a sense of community and family within what they do, but the truth is that there's this other dimension when it gets to a certain point where if you have an artist, they'll either leave to go to a much bigger gallery or like in my case, I have one artist that I share with a much bigger gallery, but like what does that mean in practice? Sharing, whereas like the idea of contracts, it's not so much protecting the relationship. Like in my case, the artist who is with a much bigger gallery is actually one of my closest friends, but the problem is just the way that it puts the artist in this awkward position and dynamic between two galleries where like a contract would just mean that like those terms are set, those business terms are set between the two galleries and the artist doesn't even have to think about them. 
because I also wouldn't want to like burden an artist with like, no, you have to like stay with me forever and guilt them when I'm like a six year old gallery and they have the opportunity to be working with one of the biggest galleries in the world. I just think that between the young gallery and the big gallery, there needs to be a formalized agreement that like honors the work and the support and the investment that the younger gallery has put in thus far, aside from your like love, mutual love for like you and your artists have for each other. I think the the contracts that I'm talking about are contracts that um, really spell out what the responsibilities are and how to deal with situations from positions of equality. Yeah, because I would say it really yeah. would serve artists too. Like the amount of artist friends I have who like are owed money, for example. That's true. By bigger galleries. Um, anyway, um, contracts. Well, I mean, uh, there is a few things that you started talking about. If it's okay, I'll address like from the beginning of it. Sure. Uh, from the viewpoint of you know this being a masochistic uh, venture or something like that, I I don't feel that way at all. Like I just I can't believe this is a job. I cannot believe you can do this. Then every day I'm waiting for somebody to come in and say, okay, oh, you thought it's a job? No, 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 you go back, you go back. You sit behind the computer and you do what you were doing. And uh, it's surprising that you can do this thing. It's like, you know, as a kid, I wanted to be a professional athlete. And uh, I was like, how amazing would it be to be, like, you know, to wake up and have to go and train to play tennis, you know? And like, you know, just do that all the time, every day, and that's all you do. And it feels that way. Um, although I feel sometimes I do need to become a professional athlete to be able to, you know, do the installs that we're doing and the number of shows we're doing and the amount of travel. And I try, I train for it every day. But um, so, so going, to, uh, going back to that, while it's really passion driven, I think everything we do is about structure, to be honest. Like the galleries that um, basically, I mean, I, I don't know how I came to call them galleries, but so for example, Daston's basement has a particular purpose, a particular method to go about things. And the way it represents the sort of contracts it signs is completely different uh, than let's say Daston plus two. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the electric room is you know, it contracts, it doesn't even have anything like written. There's nothing written about it. It's just this free flowing space that does an exhibition every week, opens Friday morning, closes Wednesday night, and then we do another one. Um, and, you know, V Gallery, we cannot do that, many, that much contracts because it's an institution in, in itself. You show like 200 works of art with sometimes 60 people, 70 people represented. How many people do you have on your team? That sounds um, like a I think right now, I think we are about 15 full time. 50? 15? One five. One five. 15. And uh, with the subcontracts and everything, it, it uh, goes above 20. But um, so, from in that aspect, uh, when you think about the sort of relationship you have with people, that's something else. You have an emotional relationship with someone um, as a friend, as a person that you trust. Um, you have a very difficult relation with another. Um, but with all of them, you have a professional relationship if you're showing in the gallery. And the contract is not a matter of like, talking to each other as equals. It's sort of a reminder note that what you're responsible for. And if you're representing 35 artists, you definitely need to do that. And some of them are doing several projects a year with us. They need to remember what the requirement for this project was, what the budget was, what is this, what is that and uh, how they would operate within an international scene, how they would operate within Iran, within this show in the electric, or that show at the basement. And I think that dictates, uh, it requires you to have a strict um, relationship in terms of knowing what is going on with it. Yeah. But uh, to go further, you know, I, we keep getting asked, uh, like, what kind of artists are you looking for? Um, in an environment like, te like Tehran, uh, or within Daston uh, galleries, I guess. It's, um, it's like asking you, again, going back to that relation, uh, relationship or you know, romantic relationships, it's like asking you what kind of a person do you want to fall in love with? And of course you don't know. Of course you don't know. Like you have parameters, you want, um, you want certain things, but um, um, it's, it's like you, know, you just have to have the right intentions 
you have to uh, not go after money, for example, or or whatever. And if your intentions are pure, um, you you get to uh, fall in love with a person, and you can be proud of that heart. And if your artist leaves you, you know it's um, it's a broken heart, and yeah. you deal with it in time. And uh, I guess that's okay because you did it for the right reasons. Another romantic. <laughs> um, I also wanted to talk about or ask you guys about gallery collaborations. If you do them, I mean, outside of let's say condo or you know, do you work with other galleries? Because uh, it's one thing to share artists, but it's another thing to also do sort of um, gallery to gallery uh, sharing. So. I think something that's very common is like, you know, amongst your colleagues who then become some of your closest friends, like we're constantly helping each other, it, lending each other money, reading each other's consignments, helping each other with each other's emails, like that's something very common, um, which is really nice. And then, you know, I've often shared art fair booths, which is also like a really nice experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is there anyone in the... Are there galleries that you are, do you, are you looking outwards and trying to like reach out to galleries that are of similar mindset or similar practice or no? Because the artists haven't mm. said that. I, I think from the beginning our mantra was like we make the rules. Um, so you know I don't know. I mean maybe we'll do condo. If you invite us, or you know, <laughs> I want to try too. <laughs> you know, um, but right now I think from the beginning it was all about providing a context mm -hmm. for the artists that they feel comfortable, they yeah. feel safe, and and I think that's why like a lot of the artists are choosing to work with us over like a more commercial gallery that does more fairs and have access to collectors. But I know in the end, like. You know, like we have realities that we need to, yeah. you know, you know, like artists need money, and I think that's kind of like where we are. You know, like uh, because like art fairs cost money, and in order to like stay open, and and in order to like grow with the artists, you kind of have to like grow up. Yeah. And actually, I also wanted to share that um, a few years ago at a really bad art fair that I'm not gonna say where, somewhere else in the world. Um, I was sitting um, at a table with a Hong Kong gallerist and an Indonesian gallerist, and we decided, why don't we just do pop-ups together everywhere? <laughs> so we started um, a very informal sharing, um, wherein we pop up in different cities as a group called Shared Coordinates. And we do maybe one or two a year, and we also pop up in each other's galleries, something like condo. Like we do, we come to Hong Kong, they come to Manila, we go to Jakarta, they come to Hong Kong. You know, so it's, and it, it's, it's wonderful because we share, we share. You know, you share the artist, you share your, the expenses, you share your clients, and it's, it's worked very much for us. And, and for, in our part of the world, all our countries are separated by water, by big water. So it's not a matter of driving, you know, you can't drive to Indonesia, you can't drive to Australia. So this cross, um, cross, cross, cross water pollination is something that's worked for us. Um, any, do you guys have any I, to say uh, about If you look at my website, I have um, 10 to 15 represented artists but nearly 100 collaborating artists. So apart from doing solo exhibitions for our uh, artists we have a close relationship with, I, we also organize group exhibitions, thematic group exhibitions that show um, artists we don't represent in collaboration with other galleries. Um, like last year we did a show on the eroticism of Japanese photography featuring nearly 80 works by 13 Japanese artists in collaboration with five galleries from Japan. Um, but so far I haven't developed it, this kind of collaboration into a systematic, a regular mode of collaboration, which I, I would look forward to. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to add that like um, the next thing for Condo is going to be a digital platform because I feel that um, 
you know, it's still in 2018, like no one's nailed a, a sensitive enough digital platform to connect people, uh, collectors to galleries. So um, I'm hoping to also collaborate with galleries or continue like a different mode of collaborating like digitally through um, technology. So let's talk about that, the digital world. Um, we're all sort of, we're all sort of adapting, attacking, trying to understand, feeling that, you know, I mean, do you guys do a lot of uh, online um, work, online world work? I just feel like, you know, we're probably all selling, obviously, on email all the time, but the problem is that, like, all the platforms that exist so far are developed with very little conversation with galleries, I feel, and their business models are all based on quantity over quality. So they don't seem to understand, like, the ephemeral uh, qualities that make a gallery a gallery. And so... Um, that's what I'm trying to address anyway with my project, but. Okay. Anything? Dastan, ah, Dastan, Hormos. <laughs> it's okay, everybody, call, everybody calls me Dastan anyway, so. Um, but yeah, it's really important actually, I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, going back to developing uh, a, a scene, a market, an audience, a lot of people still don't walk into the gallery but I think if it's if you have a good presence online, I mean, you're often uh, facing, it doesn't matter how many spaces yeah, you have. I, I wonder though, how many, do you guys track your website visitors? Yeah, of course. And what what is it? <laughs> what, she, by the way, Vanessa does not list her art fairs on her website, um, which she just never thought of. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Um, no, I'm... Um, yeah, website visitors. Is it going up? Is it going down? Are you? I mean, because we spend so much money on websites, but but it's like this, like almost encyclopedic. Like nobody goes into an encyclopedia anymore. You know, they just want to know you have one. So, um, no, I think I think uh, you, you get a lot of website uh, yeah. visitors. Yeah, I mean, I think the the website is very very important it, because you have so much information you need to archive, and people need to like you yeah, can't even explain it. Yeah, but do people read it? Do you know if people are reading all this information that you're putting out? Uh, well, a lot of the things uh, that we focus on is, of course, we have written material, a lot of written material, but we try to uh, get the point across visually. So I was saying, like, if you have, you have limited space, regardless of how many spaces you have, so, and you have limited hours, because you can't be open 24 hours even though I want to. But, so the website is open 24 hours. Uh, and you, you can have your visitors there. It gives you other possibilities that you just cannot have a physical space. Like, for example, uh, the artist that we're showcasing right now, Sam Sami, creates iPad paintings that you can have on your website and you can just download and print it and put it on your wall if you want. Uh, other people that uh, we work with, they create digital art that you can experience over, over web with their app and uh, you just have that full out personal experience in the comfort of your home. And I don't think it gets more personal than that. But I think technology is really one of the main answers to a lot of problems we have. And I think blockchain is going to definitely play a very, very important role within this um, in, in so many ways. I mean, I could name four uh, particular ones. One is with storing information. Uh, in a way that you can uh, you can scale access to that information rather than just going on the website and everything is there. You wouldn't put up your passport information up there, but for certain people, if they need to check, like the immigration can go on it if they have a pass. Within blockchain, you can do that. You can have smart contracts where um, everything is formulated and regulated. You can um, have, for example, um, several many buyers for one work where uh, is a democratic way of owning a work gives you the possibility of perhaps um, for a country that uh, a lot of things are happening in the private sector to create their own museum by having many patrons uh, buying uh, you know, into a, a fund that is consists of uh, cryptocurrency. And you can accept cryptocurrency. So you don't, you're not, you know, our exchange system in Tehran is very, very, very volatile. Like it changes one day to another. So like all of a sudden you have a 40% increase in the rate of dollars uh, to Tomans. Mm -hmm. And crypto really so crypto can help is with a, that. It's an alternative, it's a viable alternative for you guys. Yeah, and it's quick. Yeah. It's 
So Perfect. do you have you have you received Bitcoin as payment for? Uh, for work? We're very close to it, but not yet. But yes, we, we've had we, we do offer accept. us Bitcoin to pay for art. Yeah, yeah, and the I, artist I accepted. Been, yeah. Our artist accepted it, but we didn't, so we got paid in cash. No, it's uh, it's really viable, I think. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Uh, I think we've. Oh, China. <laughs> so, um, Mimi, can you tell us about this growing engagement with China, with, with visitors or with um, um, audiences from China? I think the only way to engage Chinese audience is to use WeChat. Um, <laughs> really, they don't, they don't answer call, they don't answer emails, and WeChat is the only way to reach them if you don't mind the censorship <laughs> for the government. Um, yeah, we spend a fair amount of time on posting on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uploading, uh, uh, updating our website, but we spend lots of time on WeChat, uh, uh, sending our newsletter, um, learning the language, because we, 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 we both uh, write Chinese, but we write the Cantonese Chinese and uh, Mandarin Chinese are quite different. We use different vocabularies, we, we, we have different ways of seeing the same thing. Um, yeah, so, so China, Chinese audience. Yeah, I feel that uh, more and more Chinese customers are coming to Hong Kong. I see, I see a lot of them at this fair, and it was uh, very significant since two years ago. Um, in the in the beginning, they came with their advisors, um, shopping at Western galleries, uh, buying blue chip artworks, and then slowly they started to come by themselves, uh, being more informed, educated, and confident. Um, yeah, this year I see a, lot, a, a new, uh, fast growing community of young Chinese collectors. Um, not only buying Western art, but also uh, being more supportive of Asian artists and uh, Chinese artists, even younger artists. So I think that's um, yeah, it's a moving. very fast growing it's, trend. Yeah, it's very quickly changing. Yeah. Very, le the learning is very quick. But it's interesting because this is like total anecdotal evidence. I don't have like actual evidence for this, but you know, most of my um, collectors, I've been doing this fair here for three years. Um, the gallery is six years old, but I. I would say that most of my clients are actually uh, Chinese and Belgian, which is really interesting because the Belgians are thought of as having this really like old culture of like traditional collecting. But I think that they're really similar, the Chinese and the, and the Belgians, because they operate in the same way. Like they're super engaged. They want to know everything. They want to spend time with you. They want to meet the artists. They all talk as a community together and exchange information. So they're actually like, I don't understand so much when people talk about um, China as if like let's educate people because like they know like Chinese collectors are extremely smart and engaged and that's why I really like dealing with them and they're like very similar to like the Belgian collectors. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Does anybody? Yes. How does the um, audience? Uh, Iran, because I think in the West, do correct me if I'm wrong, but we get so much um, uh, distorted press, mainly from you know America, whatever, that we feel Iran is a dangerous place, Iran is a this and that place, and I actually would like to come to Iran. So how do the, um, the public react and buy or engage with all your... 64 projects. <laughs> That's, uh, thank you for your question. Um, honestly, one of the main things in Iran that uh, makes you excited and gives you energy to do it is the public, because people are highly engaged with, uh, with contemporary art. They, they come to the shows in incredible numbers. You know, uh, Electric Room is a 30-meter room. Uh, one side is a window to outside like street. The other one is uh, it has like a large electric fixture to it. So basically, you have two walls. Often we show one work uh, only, and it's only uh, over there from Friday to Wednesday. But we have in the four hours that is open on the opening day, we have all of a sudden 250 people come to see one work of art, and then they go home. Like they they come in to see a work of art and go home, and um, 
in, in the bigger spaces, we get over a thousand visitors sometimes in four hours. And uh, I don't know if that doesn't give you energy, what does? Um, it's safe, it's nice. Um, people are engaged with it, they talk about it constantly. And we like to give back. Like when, you, when they say audience, we say, um, who is, who is the collector, who is the audience? To us, it's the same. Because, um, like for example, two years ago we had a project when uh, an artist could, in the back of their like, two-page catalog, they could, have, uh, they could actually do an artwork for that, and it would be reproduced uh, 100 times, uh, signed by the artist, and just given to the first person that, like, first hundred people that walk into the gallery. So just by attending, they could become collectors. And people do, and they frame it, and we see it in their homes. Um, it's, uh, the audience in Iran is just incredible. Like, uh, you have to see it to believe it. One more question. But wouldn't you say then that there's a very really important role in what you do as well? <coughs> Given that you have uh, mainly a local audience and that Iran is considered to be a little closed? Uh, excellent. Uh, yes, absolutely. Art fairs have become very crucial to uh, what we do because it allows you to uh, all of a sudden show to a, a wider audience. Like, as uh, you just pointed out, many people wouldn't come to Iran just because of media or difficulties or many reasons. I mean, travel ban and all that. So, um, it's very important for us to come to fairs because the audience all of a sudden becomes a much more international audience, um, people that we wouldn't see ever, maybe, they wouldn't come to Iran. And we hope to have a positive effect on that so that, so like, you know, for example, I invite you to come to Iran next time. Please do. But uh, the fairs create a unique opportunity often. Uh, that's why we try to do uh, different projects in fairs rather than what is probably more easiest to sell. Like, you know, a different different um, way of showing the art, a different sort of art that people um, would show at a fair, because we need to uh, cater to the audience, um, uh, international audience, that um, give them the feeling of what the gallery is about in Iran, rather than what we can sell in a fair outside. Does that answer? Any more questions? Yes? Uh, hello, I have two questions. Uh, when you promote a local uh, artist internationally, uh, what's the main difficulty that you might have as a gallery? And secondly, when I read the report of the um, percentage of the artworks that is collected by uh, collectors, uh, mostly it's the Western, uh, Western artworks, and the Asian artworks is, uh, have a very little percentage. So is this because of the system of the Western um, uh, gallery auction house is more developed than the Asian? Uh, is that because of the, the, the creativity or the test of the artist uh, in the Western world is more uh, approaching? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would think, like, say in my gallery, I think I have 11 artists now, two are from Asia, but I think that, um, you know, I grew up in Brazil and there's a similar thing where it's just, it's just the history of colonialism, isn't it? Also, a lot of Asian galleries don't report what they actually sell. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, what, yeah, they keep things to themselves, right? Yeah. I, I, it's also because of the economics of art fairs. That, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense to feature very young artists at a fair like this, for example, which costs you half a million to participate in. Um, yeah, look at the I price mean, point of it, most of the works represented yeah, by us. If you us, read uh, er, t uh, today, the news is a thirty-five million dollar de Kooning that was sold within two hours of the opening. I'm just like, that's great. But oh, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. But there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, but they want they want the bullet points. They want the big numbers and and you know, if I tell you, you know, we met eight really good people the first day. And you know what? They're all going to come to my gallery in Manila and they're all going to buy something the next 10 years every year. You know, no, but that's not exciting. But 35 million dollars that's exciting, you know. So art is a long game. Um, 
but honestly, I wish uh, more information was shared, to be honest, because uh, it, it allows for a lot of opportunity. You know, like, for example, you understand where uh, the Aikido, you know what the numbers are. Uh, you can imagine where um, where market should go yeah. and where the, you need to the be. Thing that, the thing that for me that, that happened to us, what's happening to us is we have other galleries taking their clients to us because they know that their clients are interested in, you know, whoever artists that we have or the program. And that's really lovely. Um, and I would do the same. Shall we do that to each other? Sure. <laughs> So um, that's it, I think. So we have uh, Dastan's basement. Please check out his website. He has so much energy. Um, Mimi from Blind Spot. She has a gallery here in Hong Kong, a uh, beautiful space. And then we have Young, who's on Commonwealth and Council in, in LA. And we have Vanessa from Carlos Ishikawa in London and everywhere else in the world and on her app. And I'm Isa Lorenzo from Manila, Silverlands. So thank you very much. We hope it was worth your time.